This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Flames are back at home after a game on Saldo Mice against the Avalanche and their road trip coming to an end. Really the final long road trip of the season besides their California swing. And Matt, uh, interesting week for the Flames. We lost to Washington, lost to Nashville. People were worried after two wins in a row, but the Flames were able to come back and put two more wins on the books and get themselves within striking distance of a playoff spot. What was your overall thoughts for the week? Well, uh, about three four weeks ago on the show i mentioned that the flames needed to pretty much cement a playoff spot by the time that we hit this point in the schedule and the flames magic number is now down to two so either two wins by calgary or two losses by the los angeles kings means that the flames will be going to the postseason so everything is looking pretty good as a flames fan it's just matter of seeing how the playoffs are going to shake out, who's going to be finishing where. The Flames could easily win the division, or they could be the second wild card team. So it's everything's a huge jumble, and we'll be playing one of Chicago, Anaheim, San Jose, or Edmonton. It's just a matter of figuring out which. Well, let's take a look back at the week that was for the Flames. They went on a bit of a road trip. They had the big win over the Kings on the 19th and then took a road trip. The first stop on that road trip was in Washington, where they took on the powerhouse Capitals. And, you know, we both, we weren't sure going into this game what would happen with this one. But um, Alex Ovechkin had a goal and two assists, and Backstrom collected three assists as the Capitals post a 4-2 win against the Flames. And I thought that this game was... Interesting to see where Calgary was because you have the best team in the league and Calgary has been red hot and I don't know about you, but I thought for most of the game Calgary held their own against the Capitals. Washington was definitely the better team. No doubt Washington played the better game. They were the better team on the ice, but I agree with you. Calgary was able to hold their own pretty well all night. Yeah, like if Giordano had scored on that one opportunity late in the third period, it would have been a tie game going overtime. Instead, a few seconds later, he took the penalty, which cemented the game for the Capitals. But all in all, like you can't really complain. Like You're going up against the best team in the NHL, and it took until the last three minutes for the game to be decided. And I guess, you know, when I was looking at this and looking back at it, the Flames had some good stretches in each period where they really, you know, took it to the Capitals and pushed hard, but just wasn't enough. And in the end, I think I'm more impressed with the Capitals after seeing this game than I am disappointed with the Flames. Like, this is a fun hockey team to watch play. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how Washington actually plays in the playoffs. So we've seen them always be near the top in the standings but then the playoffs roll around and they falter but the team's overall defensive play has improved significantly so I wouldn't be shocked if this might be the year that you see Washington break through and potentially reach the finals they're like the sharks of the east they always choke somewhere yeah uh, which doesn't make any sense because usually they're always better significantly than their opposition and yet they get Yaroslav Halak <laughs> having a magical run or other random weirdness happens to them. And it's like, uh, how did you guys lose? You should have walked away with the cup without a, much difficulty. And yet it seems like they have a hard time getting out of the second round. And in this game, uh, the Flames were without Michael Furland. He was still out for his uh, mumps evaluation and without Matthew Kachuk, who actually got suspended after the previous L.A. game for that elbow on um, Drew Doughty. on Doughty when they played against the L.A. Kings. So, you know, we were without two good players, and obviously we also had Weidman sitting out. And um, But, you know, without two key pieces of the Flames lineup as well, and I think that partly contributed to the Flames' loss. I won't say it was all of it, but I think, you know, 
I think we could have had a showing more like the Pittsburgh showing if we would have had those key pieces back in our lineup. Oh, for sure. Anytime you take two top six forwards from elite lines in the NHL, it's going to cause some difficulties in your lineup. And that's not a slight to any of the replacement players, but it just, you can't be depleting that much of your offensive scoring power and expect to go up against the best team in the league and skate with two points. Well, I think it shows just how valuable those two guys are. I mean, Michael Furlan is not a guy we'd normally look at as a first-line player, but has definitely had some chemistry there. And, you know, the rookie Matthew Kachuk has definitely stepped in and played a huge role this year. Yeah, and... Well, in each of the first two games of the week, we saw how much Matthew Kachuk meant and means to that line with Backlund and Froelich. So the next game of the week, the Calgary Flames went on to Music City. They played the Nashville Predators in Nashville. And uh, Pekka Rene stopped 24 of the 25 shots he faced. Colin Wilson notched two assists to lead the Predators to a 3-1 to one win against the Flames. Th- these are two teams that if you look at them in the standings are pretty equal. If you look at the seasons they've had, they mirror each other in a lot of ways. So I was really interested to see what would happen with this one. Yeah, and for a change, Pekka Rene actually played like the goaltender that we've been used to for the last number of years. Well, that's also why I think Nashville's struggling is they haven't got out of Rene what they usually do. If you look at the Flames, they I thought they played okay. They didn't play their best game of the year, but they played the game they needed to play. They played you know a good 60-minute effort, and if you can play like that, even in a losing effort, you're going to do okay. You're not going to win every game. Uh, it, no matter how good of a team you have, you're still going to lose 20, 30 games a year. So, like, even Washington's lost 25 games this year. So, they had a good effort. They held their own. They just couldn't get the breaks to get the goals. And, you know, it doesn't help when you have five power plays and you can't score on any of them. And I think that was really, in this game, a lot of credit goes to Pekka Rene for that. But... You know, we had a lot of power play chances, and you got to take advantage of those if you're going to win a game. Yeah, and the, the power play has struggled recently. One wonders if they shouldn't switch the D pairings on the, the each of the units, like reverse them, have Versteeg and Brody as, on the second pairing with Giordano and Hamilton on the first pairing, but we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. With what Gullitson's done with this team, you got to trust he knows what he's doing right now. Yeah. I could see them sh- maybe uh, in the last couple games of the season if there's not really anything to play for in terms of jockeying for position, maybe trying out different things there just to have a one or two game experiment. But I, other than that, uh, yeah. And this was the first time since January 24th that the Flames have lost two games in a row. And, you know, when you think about that, where we are now the end of March, that's really quite impressive. It's almost like Calgary has been the anti-Colorado avalanche over the same duration. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've lost, but not losing two in a row, that shows that, as we've seen in the past sometimes, Calgary just get deflated when they lose. They lose, and then they get deflated, and they'd come out the next night playing frustrated, and they'd lose again. And so that's really showing that they're able to bounce back and get back on that horse when they lose, which, you know, especially if you're going to be a playoff team, you can't be losing two, three in a row. No, because then your season's over very, very quickly. (laughs) So after the defeat in Nashville, the Calgary Flames went to St. Louis to take on the former team of two of our Flames, Brian Elliott and Troy Brower, who came from there last year. And I was happy to see that Troy Brower opened the scoring against his former team as the Calgary Flames uh, won 3-2 in the overtime. And uh, Monaghan scored in the final seconds of overtime. That was a crazy goal. And Elliott made 29 saves as the Flames topped the Blues. With this game, St. Louis was red hot. They were 9-1 in their last 10 games heading into that game. And Jake Allen has been exceptional pretty much for the last couple months. So, especially the fact that we never do very well in St. Louis, especially over the last five or six years, this was... Uh, 
very tough game for the Flames. And again, just like with Washington, they held their own. And when St. Louis is on their game, they're an elite team. And they've struggled for a good portion of the season due to the goaltending. Because they were getting a similar caliber of goaltending performance that we did last yeah. year, and it well, really did sink them for the first couple of months. They and worked. Allen looked terrible in the first couple of months, too. Yeah, and now the, they're actually getting goaltending that is commiserate with the team that they have, that they're playing a lot more like themselves. And it was a tough game for Calgary. They did get a handful of lucky bounces. And, like, the shot by Bartkowski went, was going well wide, hit off of the Bowmeister's skate, goes in. Monahan's and even goal Monahan's bent. pass off Brodziak's skate. Yeah, and even Brower's shot deflected off one of the blue sticks. So, you know, it was one of those weird games where only one goal was actually scored directly off the player's stick, and that was the first St. Louis goal. But you know what? The way that, especially against a team like St. Louis and the way we're going, you take the win however you can get it. Oh, yeah. And this was very much a playoff-style game, and Calgary skated away with the win, and that's an important lesson for the team moving forward. And, you know, as Monaghan was saying after the game, that's why it's important to just throw pucks on net. You know, he said just throw pucks on net, anything can happen. Um, you get a good bounce, you get a lucky bounce, and in this case, they got a few and they took them. And, you know, you could argue that some bounces haven't gone the Flames' way this year, but, you know, this was a game definitely where the hockey gods were smiling down on the Calgary Flames. Yeah, and then they're pushing themselves into remaining in the hunt for the division, and that's the important thing. Because yeah, with all the teams in our division, they're all seeming to be winning right now, and it's a real dogfight for first, second, third, and the wild card. You don't want to give up a point to St. Louis, but you know at the same time we got the two, and St. Louis isn't going to impact us that much. No, and well, they might. We may end up falling into the second wild card and facing Chicago, but at this point, I think it would be more likely that St. Louis would pass Nashville, and we'd still finish out of Nashville. Because St. Louis's schedule for the last handful of games is pathetically easy, so. And then speaking of pathetically easy, a game that the Flames should have had an easy time with, the Colorado Avalanche and the Calgary Flames met at the Sal Dome on Monday night. Uh, the Flames defeated the Avalanche to move within one point of second place in the Pacific Division, and this was a four-two Flames win. And I thought that you know what the the Flames really. I don't know about you. I thought that for the first period, definitely, they were the better team. They came out in the first playing as well as I think they have against any team recently. Um, and but they, they took their foot off the gas. They did. It, you know, you don't want to embarrass the other team. As long as you're winning and you get the two points, who cares? Like, if it's a 7-2 game or a 4-2 game, does it really matter? Like, but, you don't need to go all out. Like, you're going to beat this team. So... Yeah, I, I don't even know if I'd say that. I mean, I think that in the in the first half of the third, Colorado's game started breaking down. There was a lot of passing to skates and that sort of thing. I think that it's, it's possible to sort of take your foot off the gas a little bit and play more of a conservative style, but I thought the Flames game broke down. Like, you know, it was getting mighty close there for a while where Colorado could have tied this game. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Like, yeah, they should have had a slightly easier time of it. But, again, you're playing Colorado. You're going to get the two points. So, like, it's hard to, like, especially when you're playing L.A., Washington, Nashville, St. Louis, like four really dynamite teams all in a row. And then you're playing a team that has, like, maybe four NHL players on it. It's like, um, you know, I was surprised yeah. when I got the lineup. It's not card. as intense. I was surprised when I got the lineup card last night in the flames press box for the avalanche. Cause there's names in here. I didn't even know were still around the league. Like we all know Colborne's over there, but I did not know that Rennie Borg was still around. Blake Como was still there. Like they can make a whole forward line of just old flames. Yeah. 
Well, and, there's a reason why they're the worst team in the last 20 years. Well, and I mean, Calvin Picard, too. I mean, you know, he's he's not a starting goalie, and they've been forced to use him after, you know, Verlamov got injured. But you can And I, I actually, I'm going to disagree with you there. I think he's actually a really good goaltender, and even though Colorado is garbage, I think they would be even worse if it wasn't for him. Like, I think he's pretty much the best player on the team, which is not saying much for the I think he's team. a good goalie. As a goalie, I'd be happy to have my organization, but I don't know if I'd look at him as my starter. He's trending that way, at least. He's still young, isn't he? Like yeah, but it's, it's a lot like Carter Hutton, right? I mean, we talked about bringing him in here last year as the backup, and I think both guys could trend to being a starter. Um, Picard's 24, I believe, but I don't know if they're there yet. Yeah, well... The the team is really broken, really. So well, this is a team I think that's going to be a lot like Edmonton of the past, where everybody's going to have a better season when they leave. Yeah, and I've said it before. I think uh, this may cost Joe Sakic his job. Yeah, well, and you can see that Patrick Waugh wasn't an idiot, and like that's why, like I'm done <laughs> at the beginning of the year because he probably saw the writing on the wall that the team was going to be this bad and. He probably wants to have a job again at some point. So, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, the head coach in Colorado right now is Jared Bednar, who's a very well-respected development coach from the AHL and ECHL. And he's taken a very young NHL team and hasn't been able to turn around. So I don't know if it's a coaching issue or if it's an issue in the room, but I think that Colorado has, I think there's more to this than what we see on the surface. Yeah. Honestly, I would not be shocked if, basically all of McKinnon, Landis Cog, and Duchesne were not wearing Avalanche jerseys in two seasons. So Could be like, right. I think I think they're gonna just blow the whole thing up and get more like just tear it down really because it, it, there seems to be something wrong with the leadership structure there. And like I've never been a fan of Matt Duchesne just because of off the ice stuff, he just seems to be too much of a partier, and I don't, I'm not sure about his habits. And I think Deshane's fine, but I don't think Deshane's the face of your franchise. I think he'd be no. a great supporting guy. True, I mean, he's a good hockey I'd, player. Oh yeah, I'm not slamming any of those guys. I'd take them in a, pretty much in an instant, depending on what you're giving up. But it's just that when those are your only guys it's sort of like Edmonton when they had Hall, Everly, Gagne and Ryan Nugent Hopkins well none of those guys is a premier game breaker like even McKinnon who was drafted first overall he's good but he's not even as good as Monaghan and Monaghan is not a star player so and the Avalanche kind of need him to be a star player and he's not so I think that, like, they're going to suck for a while, obviously. And I wouldn't be shocked if you start over the next couple seasons seeing what, like, what Edmonton did by moving P Pulu Yarvi, moving Gagne, moving Yakupov, moving Hall. I think you're going to see the same kind of thing with Barry, Duchesne, Landeskog, and McKinnon as, like, the new people that they get in supplant the old guard. Yeah, I think, you're, I think you're right. So a couple of Flames milestones this week that are interesting. After the St. Louis game where Monaghan scored the OT goal, uh, Sean Monaghan now holds the franchise record for overtime goals. And that's, you know, for a young guy, I guess, well, I won't say overtime is more important than it ever was, but for a young guy, I like to see that there's still new records being broken now. A lot of these records still belong to, you know, Flames of the 80s. So that's nice to see. And after the Colorado Avalanche game, interesting stat, the Calgary Flames have now won after the Avalanche game 31 consecutive times when holding the lead after two periods. Calgary's only loss this season when leading after 40 minutes came on October 15th, where they still earned a point in a shootout loss. So, uh, you know, what this is telling us, if Calgary can get up early, they, you know, they have the the skills and that mental makeup to win. Um, so, you know, I guess going to the playoffs, we just got to make sure that we're leading after, after 40 minutes. 
because they they have not yet lost this season when they win after forty. I wonder if that I, I'd be curious to see how that compares with other teams. If that's a pretty common well, thing or not. Well, that's a decently common thing for elite teams. Like if I recall, like Chicago went a couple of years without losing after leading after two periods. So it's a good sign, at least that like Calgary is resilient enough where even if the other team gets the equalizer, they still skate away with the two points. Yeah, for sure. Matt, we've talked a lot over the last couple of weeks with the win streak and all that about a lot of the forwards, a lot of the guys providing the offense. But I think we've kind of overlooked the captain of this team. And Giordano, as we know, had a bit of a rough beginning of the season. He and uh, Hamilton had to build some chemistry there. But if you take a look, he's actually been a really important part of the Flames' play since January. Um, Mark Giordano has 13 points, 6 goals and 7 assists, and an NHL best plus 20 rating since January 26th. The 33-year-old seems eager to make his return to the playoffs, which he hasn't been in a postseason game since 06-07, and he's scored or assisted on Calgary's game-winning goal 13 times this season, four of them goals and eight of them assists. So, you know, we I think sometimes the defensemen get overlooked, especially the guys that aren't putting up huge numbers back there, but Weidman can, or sorry, Giordano continues to be a, a force in the blue line, and he's really a big anchor and a b- big reason why we're having success. Yeah. And you know, he's getting older. His points are going to go down, but he, he's good for more than just points from the blue line. Yeah, and he and Hamilton have been one of the best pairings, period. Well, I think if you look at it over the whole season, they've been the best pairing. We haven't had enough uh, Brody-Stone pairing to really be able to, you know, to really be able to, to judge them over the whole season. But talking about the defensemen... Um, We've been wondering for a while what the Flames are going to do next year with defense. And you and I have sort of talked about might Derek England, who's a you know Las Vegas guy. I think he lives in the offseason still. Might he go to Las Vegas? Would he want to come back here? Well, today, uh, Treliving, our GM, Brad Treliving, was talking to media on uh, Elliot Friedman and, and Sportsnet. And Treliving did indicate that he wants to bring Derek England back, who is a free agent but that he probably has to sort out the fourth defenseman first. So, you know, it could be Stone that they bring back. It could be somebody else. It could be a young kid. Matt, let's start with, do you think, what would you think if the Flames brought Derek England back in a 5-6 role? I have no complaints over Derek England returning. Like, if he takes, like, a two-year 5 million, 5.25, so, like, 2.5, 2.7 in that range contract, That'd be perfectly acceptable. It's sort of like when the Flames re-signed Sarich at the, his last contract. You know, decent veteran defensive defenseman that you can throw on the third pairing. He's doing the job. There's no reason to get rid of him. I don't think it's necessarily getting rid of him. I wouldn't be surprised though, if he does jump ship to Vegas. I wouldn't be either, but it's one of those things I can see it... Ha- happening either way because like if you look at the expansion draft uh, the new las vegas team is likely going to be stacked with defensemen and goaltending so i don't even know if they're going to want to bring in Derek england just yeah because... i can i don't know i can see them doing like atlanta did though and taking a bunch of goalies and then trading them true but my thing with England is I want them to figure out the number four first, whether that's Stone, whether that's somebody else. And I think that's going to depend on England's fate. If we can get a different number four, then I would say I would take Stone over England. Oh, for and- sure. You would take any number four over England, but you know you don't want to be, say, going into next season with whichever one of Hickey, Anderson, or Shillington plus Brett Kulak is your bottom pairing. Like, that's not no, but at the a same recipe time, for success there. There's other NHL veteran guys who, um, you know, you could bring in as a 5'6", who might be cheaper than England, too. So I think you have to get the number four signed up and then see what happens. Like, sure. I don't, I don't want to just re-sign England now just because, you know, we like him and he's here. I really want to make sure that we're getting... We're getting the right player, and we need to shore up that number four spot first. Um, you know, looking at some of the defensemen that might be available, Dmitry Kulikov, you and I have talked about 
Alsner, like there are some number fours available out there. Um, and, and even looking at number fives that might be out there, you know, there's guys like um, Orlov, maybe a guy like Mark Street, Brian Campbell, Nick Schultz. Like there's some other veteran guys that I think could replace England if Stone is there as well, because Stone takes some of that physical role that England's playing. So I'm not necessarily sold Michael Stone as a number four. I think he'd be a good number five, but I don't think that I don't think you bring both Stone and England back. It it depends on the cost. Like if you're getting say the two of them for six million dollars combined, then sure. Yeah, that's not gonna happen though. I don't think like Stone's making what four million now. Yeah, he had, he had a bad season thus far this year though. So, so let's so. say he gets three. Say three, three and a half, you get England for two and a half. You're getting in that ballpark of six okay. million for the two. And I, I also would not want England on more than a one year at this point. I think with the number of I'd go, th- I'd go two just because like that would get you to actually get him to sign. I yeah, don't I, think, I don't think he's bad enough for a one year deal is all that he'll get. It's not that so. he's bad, but I'm just looking at what we have in the system and the guys we have coming up. And I'm not sure I want to be saddled with a uh, five, six defenseman for two years. Again, I think there's a lot of guys that can turn over in that role. Yeah. And again, you could like any team would want a player like Derek England. So if need be, you could trade him after the one year. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I've never been a huge England fan. I mean, you know that. I criticized the move right from the beginning. Yeah, he's looking good, but I just don't feel that he's a guy that needs to come back here. I think that same position can be filled with another defenseman. I think Stone is a worthwhile replacement for that same physical defenseman, and there's other veterans we could get. I don't want a third pairing of two kids. I don't want like a Shillington-Anderson pairing. I think you need a veteran there, but I can see like a Shillington-Orlov you know, Orlov pairing or Shillington-England um, pairing. But I think you, we need to know what, what's happening with number four first. I don't want a 5-6 that's Shillington Stone because the other four are locked up because then we have no kids to bring up. And I think it's about time we bring at least one of our kids up. Yeah, and especially with them signing Hickey recently. like it, they Or no, they didn't yet. Never mind. We're expecting uh, a Hickey signing. But we yeah. have, I mean, we have Rasmus Anderson in the NHL right now. He hasn't played yet, but he's with the team. Yeah, so... So I think you have to make room for one of them. Yeah, with those three guys likely all being pretty much ready for the NHL starting next season, like you're going to need to make some room so eventually so that those guys can start to get in there. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's ready yet. I'd put him in the AHL for a year, but I mean we have other defensemen that if we need an NHL guy, we have some. So I just yeah, I mean uh, in an ideal world, maybe uh, you know England and Stone both have a place here, but if we get another number four, I think that you pick between the two. Yeah. If Stone's a number four, they can both be here, but I don't think you can have them both as your five six. And I think Stone may also win a contract just because, even though he might not be a bona fide number four, just because he and TJ look so good together, yeah, he might earn that number four spot. And, um, Matt, another, I guess, move or roster transaction, we're not talking about, um, you know, the signing of Hickey potentially happening. The Calgary Flames recalled Garnet Hathaway from the AHL. That was their second call-up since the deadline, the first one being Rasmus Anderson. And they're only allowed four of them, so they recalled him before the Capitals game, and they sent him down just after the St. Louis game, right? Yeah. So it was one of those that they needed somebody in case, like for Kachuk basically replacing him. And yeah, didn't get to play, but they're going on a road trip, and I imagine we'll see the same thing happen before the California road trip next month. Yep. So I know you're a big, uh, I, I know you're a big Hathaway fan, and I I think Hathaway's going to make the team out of training camp next year. I just think it's a matter of moving the Boma contract somehow in the off season to allow him to do that. Yeah, and that shouldn't be too hard, really, because every team needs a good fourth line forward, and Boma has enough track record of that year that he scored 16 goals that 
Some team will want him, so. Colorado seems to like old flames. You think they'd take him? Yeah, give us a fifth round pick. Call it a day. It'll be the probably the first fifth round pick. Yeah. Um yeah. It might be a sixth then, but we're we're kinda we'll short see. we're kinda short on picks this year, so Yeah. Well yeah, I, th- they did manage to do one thing this week that to uh, help at least get some prospect in the organization from after losing the two dra- draft picks at the deadline. Yeah, they uh, signed defenseman Josh Healy from Ohio State, a uh, U.S. college player, and he's a, he's one of the free agent U.S. college players. And he's been making a bit of a name for himself. This is a year where we haven't seen as many U.S. college guys. It's a weak draft year, weak U.S. college free agent year, but... Healy was a guy that, from what everyone's saying, really attracted most of the attention of all 30 teams. He's 6 feet, 196 pounds. Scouts say he's a decent first-pass defenseman, but his forte is open ice hitting and playing a hard physical game. He projects as a depth, potentially third-pairing guy. Um, I I don't know if he's necessarily going to be an NHL regular at any point in his career, but always good to get young defensemen in. And I think this guy might be really what they were you know this might be sort of what we're looking for with the Kanzig signing even though he's not as big but he's that very physical defenseman well when I heard that the Flames signed him it my initial thought was oh they replaced Patrick Seeloff with the clone of himself you know a uh, physical defensive defenseman I think uh, Healy's got a little bit better passing ability than Seeloff, but more or less, that's what you're getting is... You know, if you look at where he'll probably slot in in Stockton, he probably replaces Kenny Morrison. Yeah. Oh, Sim- for sure, yeah. Similar players, same spot in the lineup. Like, this is just the next Kenny Morrison, because I think we're probably moving on from Morrison. Yeah. And if he emerges and actually plays an NHL game, hey, awesome. If not, hey, good st- good depth for Stockton. Yep. Um, and interesting note is he is an Edmonton boy, so from Alberta. He knows his way around here quite well. Um, 22 years old, so he'll be going right to the AHL next year. And I love the way this contract was structured. You've heard me rant in the past, last year and other seasons, about hating it when the teams burn a year on the deal for you know one game. So I love that this contract starts next season. But the Calgary Flames convinced him to take an amateur tryout agreement with the Stockton Heat which I believe means that he can actually play AHL games, but he's not officially starting his contract till next year. Yeah, so they don't burn a, a year. Which I don't think it would have mattered. I think that uh, he would have been on a three-year deal if he played now versus a two-year starting next year. But either way, who cares? It, yeah, so, so good for him to get in there, good for him to meet the team. I mean, this is the team, you know, I have no no qualms that he's going to be in Stockton next year. He's not going to make the Flames. There's too much de- young defensive depth. Um, we'll put so it this he, way, if he makes the team next year, something will either have gone drastically wrong in the off season, or he will have emerged, <laughs> done something like massive amounts of development to come out of nowhere. So... If he makes Pretty the team next year, it means we're the next Colorado Avalanche. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's good to have him in Stockton. His U.S. college season is over. Why not bring him in, let him see how the team works, get him acquainted with the team, you know, be ready to go. And, um, you know, then he knows the players, knows the system, knows the coaches for next year. It's a win-win all the way around. Yeah, and in addition to the, the signing of uh, Josh Healy, the Flames are also in the hunt for both Spencer Fu and Justin Kluse. So a couple of forwards, uh, both right wingers. So it, nothing to report there in terms of like actually signing on the dotted line, but they are still trying to see if they can add any, any more prospects. Yeah, we've had mixed results lately with college free agents. We've seen some... That have done well for us some like you know um kenny morrison that haven't done well for us the one thing i'm still waiting for is to see if calgary brings over any european free agents this year we had some good success with pre bowl and riddich last year so i wouldn't be surprised if we dip our toe into the european market as well yeah 
But Matt, you were mentioning earlier Brandon Hickey, who the Flames were expected to sign. And for those that don't remember, Brandon Hickey was our third round draft pick, 64th overall in 2014. He's currently 20 years old. He's a Lu- uh, the Duke, Alberta kid, left shooting defenseman, six foot two, 180 pounds, or six foot, 180 pounds. And he's been playing for Boston University for the last couple of years. And some people think that Hickey might be ready to jump right to the NHL this year or next year. What do you think? Well, I wouldn't be shocked if the, they do sign him. It'll be a, like when the Flames signed Gaudreau and Arnold where he'll get in a game to burn a year on the contract for next year. Because like, he does have a full year remaining in college. So the Flames, in this particular case, will need to have a sweetener to get him to sign right now. And I think the only way that they'll be able to do that is to actually dress him in an NHL game but between now and the end of the season. And I wouldn't be disappointed by that. You, got, you have to see what these young players can do. Hickey is a very good offensive defenseman, and... It doesn't hurt to see what you have when once the playoffs begin. See, so. and, I, and I have mixed feelings on Hickey. I mean, when we had Goudreau and stuff, we were trying to build this rebuilding team, and we needed that you know top young forward to come in, and I think that was a big reason why they gave Goudreau the deal they did. I would be okay if Hickey wants to stay in college one more year. I think if you look at the defensive depth we have in Stockton, there's no need to bring him in next year if you know he wants to stay in college. We've got Shillington, we've got Anderson, we've got a few other young yeah. guys there. But then you risk the whole him pulling a Justin Schultz type thing. Like, do you want to risk losing him for nothing? Like, that's where like I would. If it was me, I would just rather have the asset locked in to the organization and yeah. sort everything else out after. Because like, he's too good of a prospect to screw around with. Yeah, I guess you're right. And if we let's just say that we're going to bring up, I think it would be fair to say two defensemen next year. Probably a number five or six and a seven. Yeah, I, I think Hickey would be one of them and probably Anderson. See, but... I don't know. Coming out of college, I think I'd want Hickey to at least start the year in the A. Not saying he wouldn't yeah. make his way up here, but I'd start him in the A, partly because we are going to be depleted a few guys. But I think it might be either Anderson and Sh- or Shillington, not both of them, and probably Kulak as your seven. Yeah, I can see that. You know, and we're probably losing Walderspoon. He's probably not going to be back. So we're going to need some defensemen. So, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe they bring Hickey in and, you know, I mean, we'll have him, we'll have Healy, Maybe that's sort of the rebuild of the Stockton depth. Yeah, because you're going to figure that Falkovsky is going to come up from the ECHL and Kanzig will probably as well. So, you know, they're going to need to have one more spot because, like, I don't expect Culkin to come back either. So that's like three or six defensemen down there going away. So if you replace them... It, internally with Hickey, uh, Falkowski, and Kanzig, there you go. See, I I think that Bartkowski is going to end up down there next year. I don't think he'll be I up. I agree. So, he'll so be I the think, veteran guy down there, yeah. Yeah, so I think that takes one of those spots. I think Kanzig will get tried out, but I'm not convinced that Keegan Kanzig is going to be an impact, even AHL player at this point. I think he'll probably end up back in the E next year. Well, we'll have to see how he does at development camp and – in the preseason and see how he goes. And then yeah, you that... always knew what, like when we picked him that like it was going to be a six or seven year deal to figure out exactly what his ceiling was. So, and then we have that defenseman that we brought over in the Lazar trade too. He's a bit of a veteran guy down there. Yeah. Mike Koska. So, you know, yeah, I think you could be right. They might bring Hickey in. I don't want to lose him like Justin Schultz, like you were saying, but I'm yeah, he's he's a good university player. I'm just not convinced he's NHL ready yet. No, but especially for it, defensemen, it's tough to make the jump from university to NHL. Yeah. But again, we're likely gonna be in a situation where our fate is gonna be sealed likely before the last game of the season. 
Like, yeah, will I, either be in the first wild card spot or in one of the second or third spots in the division? Yeah, I have no problem bringing him in for a look this year, but I think, you know, saying that he's yeah. ready for the NHL next year is a little foolhardy. foolhardy. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Uh, I he, think if we didn't have defensive depth like we did three years ago, yeah, for sure he'd be the best guy we have. But to me, we've just got guys that either have earned or need a spot before Hickey. Yeah, I agree. Hickey's, Hickey's I'm 20. Not, I'm not arguing with you. We're both on the same thought there. So, yeah, I'm expecting that deal gets done, like you said, in the next week or so here. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if Hickey's joining us for the California road trip. Maybe that is the elixir that it will take to beat Anaheim in the Honda Center. Could be. <laughs> So if the Calgary Flames tomorrow night beat the LA Kings in regulation, they're going to clinch a playoff spot. We don't know which one, but they'll clinch a spot. Um, and that really means that, Matt, I mean, it's been a while since we've said this, but we've got to start looking at playoff hockey in Calgary. It feels weird. It's and only twice since 2010. Yeah, I know. And, you know, we're still a rebuilding team. You and I weren't sure if we were going to do it this year, and we'll talk more next week about – you know, as we get closer to the end of the season, what's going on. But Glenn Gullitson said last night in the press conference after the game that this team wants to do it on their own. They don't want to wait for other teams to do it for them. They want to seal their fate because the elite teams seal their own fate. And I agree with them, but I think that it would be nearsighted to say that this was all Calgary Flames. I think a lot of our success this year has also been due to a weak Pacific division. Um, We've been able to... Eh, not, the division's not actually that bad. It's just the ever there are four teams that are pretty much equivalent with one another, and there's no runaway winner like with, say, Chicago or... Well, e yeah, I can't say even the Metro division because all four of the teams at the top are awesome, so... Yeah, it, it's a weak division, but it's not like a terribly weak division. No, but if you look at this division in the past, I mean, if you look at the Pacific, Anaheim, San Jose, Edmonton, Calgary, LA, Vancouver, Arizona, in past years, it's definitely a weaker division than it has been. You know, I mean, even if we look at last year, Vancouver, LA, were maybe not LA, but LA has been a strong team. I mean, they're Stanley Cup team in the last handful of years. Vancouver's on the downslide. Edmonton's starting to pick it up, but, you know, I think that uh, the weak division has contributed maybe not all of the success, but some of the success to allowing Calgary to sneak in. And you and I even said that at the beginning of the year. If we sneak in, it's probably partly due to the division that we're playing in. Yeah. I think we have a lot of a rebuild going on in this division. Vancouver's going to need a rebuild. LA's going to need a rebuild. Arizona, we don't really know what they're doing. San Jose's pretty much done. Yeah, After this is really this the, year, this is their swan song, really. Yeah, cause... so they're going to be going into a rebuild. So I think that that's going to help Calgary even going forward. I think Anaheim, Edmonton, Calgary are going to be the three dominant teams in that division. Yeah, and as each of the those three teams figures out the secondary pieces on their team, that will be uh, what determines who will be kings of the division. And like I think that. And even there, the team, Anaheim's getting old, too. Yeah, like, if you look at the three teams, the one that is set up the best f moving forward is Calgary, just due to the fact that we only need a couple of minor things that are easily fixable. And yeah, I, whereas, I like, think... Whereas, like, Edmonton it, has, like, major structural problems that are being largely glossed over because McDavid is awesome. I think Edmonton's bought themselves a few years to fix things, and McDavid can still take them into the playoffs for at least a couple of years. Yeah, like they could eventually win a cup, Edmonton, but it's going to take a lot of work to figure out the secondary part of their lineup. They're still too top-heavy, and if you can contain that one guy, you can win that playoff series. But we've so. also seen that Chirelli's not afraid to make the moves that have to be made there. True. Um, yeah, San Jose, I think you're right. This is their swan song. Anaheim, they're getting older. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about this in our future episodes we get close to the expansion draft, but I wouldn't be surprised if one of their big money contracts has moved out of there this year. Ryan Kessler? I'm, I Honestly, I think Kessler's going to end up in Vegas. Yeah, that 
Yeah, it depends. If uh, Vegas is smart, I wouldn't touch that contract with a 10-foot pole, personally. Yes and no. I mean, you need somebody there to sell, you know, to be your star. Yeah. And I think that you can take on the Kessler contract, and even by the time you get good, Kessler will be out of there. Yeah. You know, I think you bring Kessler in, you give him a C. I think that if you think of the marquee outside the arena, whose face do you put on it? I see Kessler and I see Flurry as their sort of names on that team. Yeah. And both guys are getting older, but you don't, I mean, you wouldn't touch them if you're Calgary or Edmonton or St. Louis or LA where you're trying to make the playoffs, but every team needs somebody they can sell, some name that you can say, look, we have somebody that we didn't just get in the leftovers draft. Yeah. So I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be surprised if Kessler's one of them. Yeah. But overall, like, this team, it's going to be, I think, honestly, it, we're going to be back in the 80s again where it's going to be Calgary and Edmonton battling for first and second and pretty much in the conference. We well, just the better win the cup years. before Edmonton. We're never going to hear the end of it. Oh, yeah. Well, I want to, you know, like, I wouldn't mind if things reversed where, like, we win five cups and they win one. <laughs> you know, you can live with that. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, then we have a reason for a new arena because we have no room left in our rafters. Exactly. There's no room for these banners. We need a new arena. Yes. Whoever the mayor is in that point, you have to build us one. Yes. We just have no space for the banners, man. That's right. Even the air vents where the banners are right now, there's no space for them. Yeah. Whatever will we do? <laughs> need more air vents. <laughs> we'll have to, or we'll have to rotate the banners out. The first five games, we put one up. The next five games, the next one. Have a periodical banner raising for no reason. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, no, that'd be nice if we can collect a few more rings before Edmonton gets theirs. Yeah. Talk um, about yeah, jumping I, the gun a little bit, eh? <laughs> yeah, well, let's let's slow down. Let's step back. Let's just look at the first round of the playoffs. We've got to make it through, you know, three rounds before we can even start talking about, you know, the Stanley Cup and even having a chance to raise a banner. So... Let's assume at this point the Flames clinch, fair assumption. Oh, it, it would be something that would go down in NHL history if the Flames didn't make the playoffs. So Considering there's, I think, what, 14 games or 12 games? No, 14 between the two teams. And LA would need every one except for two to go exactly their way in order to for them to leapfrog us it's just not happening so so with six games left in the season we have probably four realistically four opponents uh going into the playoffs we've talked a little bit about this in the past but matt it's possible we could play san jose anaheim edmonton or chicago in round one do you have a preferred matchup i it for me i would take san jose and then Edmonton as my first and second choice. And honestly, I think I'd take Chicago after that, even though they're the best team in the conference. So, I mean, a lot of people that I've talked to recently have said that they would take San Jose first because San Jose isn't looking great lately. They've uh, been on a little bit of a fall. Why, why did you put the teams in the order you did? Well, San Jose is the oldest team, and... Calgary is built in a very similar fashion to the Pittsburgh Penguins. They're not as fast, quite as fast as the Penguins, but they play a similar style, and Pittsburgh handled the Sharks rather easily last year. And I think that between the fact that their best players are getting older and that stylistically we play a similar game to a team that handled them rather well last year, I think that would... And the fact that, well, frankly, they're three and seven in their last ten, so they're not very good right now. Add all that in together, and I think the Flames could easily win that series. I still think that you know, from both a fan side and a hockey side, I would like to see us play Edmonton first. Oh, same that here. That would be the most fun option. Oh, I think that Edmonton too. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, they're really two things: they're a goaltender and a shooter. Yeah, And we also, I mean, part of me also wants vengeance. You know, they kicked our ass this year. Let's be frank. We lost the entire series to Edmonton. We're a lot better team now. We want to go out and show them, you know, we can win four games against you. 
But I think that the Calgary Flames, if you play the Edmonton on this first round, we can, I think, contain McDavid. We can get goals on Tubbo. I think I don't think it would be an easy win, but I think it would be a fun series, and I think it would be a series the Flames could win. I agree. And, like, yeah, Edmonton has some good pieces, but they're a very top-heavy team, and top-heavy teams, like we've seen earlier we were mentioning Washington Capitals. It was basically the Ovechkin show. And when you have a team that's built around one guy – no matter how good that one guy is, you can beat that. And, like, that's why, like, Pittsburgh, when they won the Cup the two times, like, they have Crosby, they have Malkin, but they also have a bunch of other good pieces. Chicago, they've got Kane, they've got Taze, they got Keith, Seabrook, you know, you can run down the list. Boston, when they won, they had Sagan, they had Bergeron, Savard, I think, it, and a whole bunch of other Marchand, Lucic, Chara. Like it, it's it's easy to a, contain one player as opposed to a whole force of them. Yeah, like realistically, that team is McDavid, Drysaddle, at Maroon, and Lucic. Really, and yeah. everybody else is. And like even Maroon and Lucic are just okay. Like they're. I was not... gonna say, base going into a playoff series, I'm not too worried about Lucic and Maroon being the difference. No. It'd I be like that... being scared of Brower and Frolik. It's like uh... I think Edmonton will bang us up. I think those guys like Lucic and Maroon are gonna play a, a hard physical game. So oh, yeah. get... it, it'd be a f- fun physical series with both teams banging the hell out of each other. But uh, you know, you look at. Our guys, like we've got Brower, Boma, Furland, Kachuk. We've got enough of our own guys that can throw some muscle around, and Hathaway's there too if anybody gets hurt. And when I look at Edmonton's back end, I'm not too worried about their defense being able to contain our top two lines. No. Like we've got Matt Benning, Andrew Ference, Eric Griba, Oscar Clefbaum, Adam Larson, Darnell Nurse, Chris Russell, and Andre Sakara. Like, you know, I think that if we can, and I've said this for years, if we can take their blue line, you're going to get a shot on net. Yeah. Especially with the first two lines we've got, the M&M line and the Goudreau monahan Furlan line. Yeah. And, like, it would be a tougher series, I think, than the San Jose one. Just It'll because... be physically more demanding. Yeah. But I think in each case, the Flames are the more likely team to skate away as the victors. I think if we take on Edmonton in round one, we're potentially less likely to make it through round two because we're going to be more beat up. Yeah. Like if Anaheim plays Edmonton and we play San Jose, I think the Flames go to the conference finals. I think if you get Edmonton in round two, whoever plays them is going to do that work for us. And I would be almost certain that we can beat Edmonton in round two. Yeah, same here. Um, I actually, I don't want us to play against the Sharks. I think based on what the Sharks did last year and based on how veteran-heavy that team is, I think they're going to come awake as soon as the playoffs happen. That could very well happen. I'm just less concerned just due to the fact of the style of our team. If we're not playing the Oilers, my preference, honestly, is the Anaheim Ducks. I think when I look at the Ducks and the roster that they have, this is a team that's an older team. Yeah, they're a good team, but I have questions about their goaltending. Uh, Both Gibson and Bernier aren't that – they're not that durable. They're guys that tend to have health problems, especially near the end of the year. So I think they could have a goaltending problem that could help us out. I think, and we've got two games against Anaheim, so maybe I'll change my tune, you know, after those two games. But right now, I don't think that they're as well coached as San Jose. I don't think they have the goaltending that other teams do. I think their goaltenders are going to, you know, lose. I think they're going to lose one of them, to be frank. I think one of them is going to get hurt or not make it through the first round. And I think that we could do some damage against Anaheim, pending we can win in Anaheim. If we if we got to drop the first two games automatically, then it's not, you know... It's almost not worth doing at that point. Yeah, that's the main reason why I'm a little hesitant with Anaheim. And I try, like, why I'd actually to... rather go with Chicago just for the stupid psychology of, oh, we suck in the Honda Center. You know, like if they can actually win on April 4th and break that stupid curse, 
then I'd feel a lot more comfortable about beating Anaheim. I was trying we'll to look see. it up today to see if there's actually a forfeit rule in the NHL because you might as well just spot them the first two games and say, we'll rest up and we'll meet you back here. Yeah. Well, we did win one playoff game there in 0506, so, you know, it's not an automatic loss. It's just... No, I'm kind of uh, joking. Uh, yeah, it's just... Yeah, for whatever reason, they just suck against them. And I I don't want to take on the Blackhawks in round one. I think the Blackhawks are a dangerous team. I think as good as we look, I'm not sure that we're Blackhawks quality. And again, I think they have the veterans and the goaltending. I think, you know, every time we played Chicago this year, Darling has looked fantastic. Um, Crawford's looked good. I think that their goaltending by themselves could steal them a series against the Flames. I don't think we have enough top-end firepower to penetrate the two goalies they've got. I think that would be a six or seven game series. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think one. we're going to get blown out, but I think Chicago... Yeah. I, I, think, think Chicago I don't think... I Yeah, I, I wouldn't... Like, honestly, I think if we play San Jose or Edmonton, we see second round. If we play Anaheim or Chicago, I don't think so. I think but, San Jose and Edmonton, we definitely see a second round, knock on wood. I think Anaheim, we can fight out enough. It's going to be a long, hard series, but I think we can fight our way to round two. I think Chicago, I don't think we make it past the first round. Yeah. It'd be a tough series. And, you know, if the Flames did get bounces, they could very well do so. But, yeah. Uh, that'd and, be I mean, looking really strategically, tough. too, I'd almost rather take on Anaheim since San Jose takes on Edmonton. Because I think San Jose will beat the crap out of the Oilers. Well, the thing is, if we actually manage to beat Chicago, then we'd a actually play whoever finishes second and third in the Central Division. <laughs> so we'd play like probably the winner of Minnesota St. Louis in round two. Cause... Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're gonna be second wild card though. Yeah. Oh, it could happen. It, could. You know. but, uh, yeah, I mean anything could happen, right? But looking at where we are now, assuming that today we're first wild card, I'm kind of going by that assumption. Yeah, and we we've well the second been there. wild card team, it, like uh, is St. Louis. They're two points behind yeah. us, but they have a game in hand. Nashville's third in the or central, and and I mean they, we're they're one only point, a point back. We're so. one point back on San Jose and Anaheim for you know se tying second third. So we may not even end up in a wild card spot. Yeah, it. It's just we're a little too far out still, and everything's just in a jumble. Yeah, but, you know, I'm okay playing Anaheim, San Jose, or Edmonton. I want to avoid Chicago. I'm not saying we couldn't beat Chicago later on. I think that... Yeah, next year, like, if the Flames get a bona fide first-line winger or, you know, somebody that is a legit top six forward, then I think the Flames are going to be in cup favorite contender mode like it you know being one of the top teams in the division and conference yeah and i mean we've been chicago this year already but i i think that maybe in round three you might be able to take them if you can you know if they've gotten beat up but i think that as soon as we meet chicago this year it's over well if say like we do make the conference final say everything goes correctly and we beat San Jose and Edmonton in round one and two, and that's how it shakes out. Honestly, I think at that point, it, it's whichever team has more youthful enthusiasm, and I think that in our case, that would actually benefit us over Chicago because we are one of the youngest teams in the league. So, I would it agree could with happen. I would agree with you if Chicago's goaltending wasn't as good as it is, but they're getting great performances all season from both guys. Yeah, but we've seen Crawford struggle in the playoffs last year against Nashville, and yeah, but then rely on Darling. Yeah, like, I'm not. I, I'm not as scared of Chicago as I would have been, say, two years ago. I'm not. A, I think it's possible we could beat them later in the rounds, like you said, round two, round three. I think if we come up against them round one, it's over. Yeah. And well, I'm not convinced right now with the play we've seen from Johnson that we have two goalies going to the playoffs. I think it's Elliott pretty much all the way through. Yeah. I know. We'll see how things shake out. I think Johnson may get a start or two at the end of the season just to try and get him going. But, yeah, I think Elliott's your guy, and you just ride him right through the end. Yeah, so I mean, my preferred matchup, like I said, if I have to pick one matchup today, it's Edmonton. 
Yeah. I think that we'll have the easiest time, and it'll be you know. And if we do go down, at least we went down fighting our rivals. You know, like how long has it been since we've had a bad love over in the playoffs? 1990. So it's been. You it's remember been a long was time. that highlight of flurry? You know, after he scored that overtime goal, everybody remembers that one. Yeah, well, that was the last time. So the question will be, who's the Steve Smith this time? Who's going to put it in Edmonton's own net? McDavid. <laughs> it's got to be a defenseman. Yeah. Uh. We got what Ference and uh, and Russell who are both double agents. Either one of them has been a flame. Maybe they're double agents and they'll score it for us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think Edmonton's my preferred, and I know people are gonna think I'm crazy, but I think Anaheim would be my second, just because I think that there's some questions with their goaltending. Yeah. Um, I'm not a I'm not a Bernier fan this year, and I don't know that Gibson is gonna. I mean, Gibson's only played forty some games, and Bernier's played thirty games. The bad thing is then they can swap goalies on you, and either one is fairly strong. It's like Los Angeles right now, but I, I think one of them's going to go down. Yeah. Well, honestly, like it's going to be a tough series regardless of who the Flames face. Oh like, yeah, it's not it, like there's not. It's not like Vancouver a couple years ago where like they kind of sucked and we kind of sucked, but we suck less. <laughs> so you know. It. Well, and, and to be honest, I mean, you know, for a large part of the season, we weren't in the playoffs. And you could debate if we deserve to be there or not. But, yeah, I mean, the reality is we're not going in as a top team in the West. No. We're going as a team that's going to have to fight our way to get whatever we're going to get. Yeah. So it's going to be a tough go regardless, but it'll be interesting at least. And as long as we don't having the same struggles in the Honda center, then I'm not really too scared of any particular opponent. Any of the four really, that's the only question mark I have is can Calgary overcome the stupid Honda center BS? Yeah. I, I want to see, I mean, we have two more games this season against Anaheim, one at home and one on the road and two more games against the sharks, one at home, one on the road. And I really want to see how the team's going to play in, in those four games. Because I think that, too, is going to help me influence, you know, make up my mind. Because it's not like we're seeing, like, with Edmonton, the October Calgary Flames playing against the October Edmonton Oilers. We're going to be seeing a March and April Calgary Flames play March and April Anaheim Ducks and a March and April San Jose Sharks. Like, those could be playoff matchups. And that's what I want to see is how we look, you know, this week and next week. Yeah. And I'm hoping the Flames win at least three of those games with preferably one of those being that April 4th game. So I just want that stupid storyline to go away. <laughs> It'd be nice. Well, Matt, why don't we uh, take a look at the next week, the homestand that the Calgary Flames have. And as we look ahead, before we do that, let's go and look back at the last week. Last week we had eight points in the table, four games. And uh, we had made our predictions. You thought we'd win everything but the Washington game and get six points. I thought that we would win... The St. Louis game, the Colorado game, we get one point against Nashville. Neither of us were right. The Flames ended up getting only four points on the week. Beating so that means that you win the season series. There's no way for you to come back at this point. Nope. I currently sit at 9-3. to three. We've still got two weeks left, but at this point, you might as well call up your farm team guessers and you know just play out the rest of the season. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, we'll we'll still we'll continue to make our predictions and we'll make some playoff predictions as well when we get there. But um, at this point, yeah, the season's over for one of us. One of us, the Colorado Avalanche, at this point, and it's not yeah. me. Yeah, I know, I suck. Boo. You've you've guessed about as good as Colorado's played. Yeah, that's about right. You got <laughs> one point. Uh, you got one point early on. We split the points in October. You got your second point. And uh, third. L and like third, two weeks just ago. March yeah. 14th. Yeah. <laughs> so and then that's from it. like October th through March, I was just absolutely horrendously bad. Well, we we're both bad. Like we we're tied three to one for most of November. Um, but that team was rocky then. We were tied all the way through December. And it was only in January that I started moving with points. And even January, we were tied 5-1 from January 9th to February 27th. Um, and then all the points started coming up. So it's been a rocky year for this team. Yeah. Well, let's to, look. Uh, it's been hard to actually label exactly what this team's all about. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, up till up till the All-Star break, I think we we're both about ready to count this team out. Yeah. Uh, well, 
they fought all the way to get back into the playoff picture, and then they had the really bad January, and it took a run like they've been on to get to where, you know, you just can't bank on, oh, we're going to win 10 games in a row. Like, no. Like, that doesn't usually happen. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it's never happened in the franchise's history. So, Well, especially a team that was looking as bad as Calgary did at some point during the season. Yeah, but they got their stuff together, and we get to look forward to some games after April 8th. Yeah, and I mean, the only thing I am I guess I'm unhappy about with the schedule now is I wish we played Edmonton once more. It was, I'm so shocked that we played Edmonton as quickly as we did, especially two games in the first I know, and it, it what, really and sucked because of the fact that the four times we played them were in the two spots in the season that that was when we sucked. <laughs> Well, the rest it, of the like, year, we've basically been an elite team, except for those two little stretches, and that's when we played them. Yeah, like I would love to see a playoff quality matchup and see if we could blow the roof off the dome with that thing. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting if that's how round one is, like, because I think the Oilers will be like, oh, we beat them every time. Like, we can just walk all over these guys. They suck. Oh, I, I have some friends in Edmonton already saying that. Hey, we beat you guys every game this season. Said, You obviously haven't been following what's been going on here. We've had a resurgence, and I'm oh. not convinced right now that it's going to be – I'm not saying the Oilers can't beat us, but I'm not convinced it's going to be as easy a game as it was. I don't think we're going to see nearly as high a score as we did from the Oilers earlier in the season. No, and you also got to remember that, like, those first couple games, Elliot was not very good. <laughs> and he's changed his game around entirely. So, yeah, I'm not concerned. Well, Matt, we're looking ahead to the final uh, homestand of the season. The Calgary Flames play four games the next week, and these are the final four home games. So if anyone wants to go out and see the Calgary Flames play this year before the playoffs, playoff tickets are always hard to find, but if you want playoff quality hockey, we're seeing it right now in Calgary. Um, we have three more games. We have the LA Kings, the San Jose Sharks, and the Anaheim Ducks this week, all in Calgary. So go to our friends at Tick Ticks on your iPhone or your Android phone, download their app, grab some tickets. You want to be in the dome for these. I was at the game last night against Colorado up in the press box. It's electric in there. It's so much fun. I haven't seen the wave go on that long in a while. Like Everybody's knowing that this team is a good team. Everyone knows we're going to the playoffs, and it feels like a playoff atmosphere in there. So get to the Dome. There's no excuse not to. And the other cool thing is usually the Flames have some pretty good giveaways at the end of the year, too, as they're trying to blow out stock and whatnot. 50% uh, off hats last night. So get out there, grab some swag, and get ready for a playoff run. So, Matt, we got three games uh, coming up this week. We've got the LA Kings on Wednesday here in Calgary. And we have the San Jose Sharks on Friday the 31st and then the Anaheim Ducks on Sunday the 2nd. And going into the L.A. game, this is going to be a different one. But uh, if the Flames can win that game, they clinch. And you also wanted to let everyone know that we've got some chirping going on already with Matthew Kachuk putting some fighting words out to Drew Doughty. Yeah, he was showing some displeasure about uh, Doughty's comments basically saying that uh, he was surprised that, uh, well, here, I'll just get the exact quote. Uh, Doughty is a good player, so I don't think his focus will be too much on me. My focus isn't on him. My focus is on the playoffs. So, yeah, and he said he expected more from Doughty, honestly, than to go right to the media and start complaining after a loss. So it's some nice cheap chirps going back the other way. You know, even though L.A. may not be a playoff team, they are a team that we see a lot during the season. They're in our division. And I like to have these sort of divisional rivalries, you know, those things that over the years you'll see how these guys interact and how it works out. It makes things a little more fun. Yeah, and, you know, that's what makes Kachuk such a vital part of this team moving forward. Because, man, is he a pain in the ass. <laughs> Isn't he? And, you know, like, there's only about five players in the league that are as much of a pain to play against. So, it, it's nice that he's on our side, so that way, you know, we can inflict him on everybody else. And I am looking forward to round one to see him just be himself. <laughs> 
Yeah, because yeah, like you, you've got Corey Perry and Brad Marchand as the two most notable guys in the NHL that play that kind of way, and he's right there with them. And well, oh, and I think, I'm just looking forward to round one. I think one thing too that the Flames have lacked for a while is personalities. You know, we've had a lot of good players, but it's been a while since we've had a big personality on this team. Yeah. And I like that about Kachuk. You know, you've got guys like Goudreau, guys like Monaghan, who are great players, not great interviews, not big personalities. And so no, I really like that. And you need dirt bags. Like, if you want to win the playoffs, you need guys that will go in the trenches and be disturbers in there and get under the other team's skin, do little cheap chintzy stuff that you know like it would frustrate you if you're cheering for the other side but that's how you win and that's how you win stanley cups is you need guys that can play over that line a bit controlled but enough to get the other team off their game and we've seen how kachuk has been able to draw penalties for most of the season by being such a <laughs> fun person so he honestly i would not be shocked if the flames ever do win the cup in the next handful of years if he is not one of the contenders for the con Smythe, just due to the fact that he is that much of a disturber and can back it up with offense for sure yeah and i think too i mean the big thing there is you can get a lot of those guys in your bottom six you yeah, know, you and I talked earlier about guys that can play that same role like Hathaway, you know, like a Furland we saw in the last series when we played Vancouver in that role. But you need those guys who aren't just the dirt players, you know, not just the, you know, the players that are just doing that. And Kachuk can back it up with the offensive side too. He's yeah, not just and now Furland can as well. So it, it'll be interesting to see in round one when you have those guys that can throw massive hits after massive hits after massive hits and back it up by scoring goals like I recall Furland scoring twice in that game six clinching game against Vancouver and that was before he was known as somebody who could score goals so like he was doing it at both ends of the ice and now we have two guys that are like that you know it that's why I wouldn't count Calgary out on going for a long run if they get the right matchups early they could actually be a shock team to go far into the playoffs just because of the type of personnel they have on their lineup well let's get back to predicting this week it's weird we have two weeks where we essentially play the same teams just in a different order once at home once on the road um the la kings game i think you're right we'll see some chirping now we'll see some chirping again before the game in california but la san jose and uh, anaheim you can't win the season but what's your prediction for the week i'm gonna go two points against la two points against san jose zero points against anaheim so you're going for four points on the week yep I think L.A. at this point uh, looks like Bishop's going to be a net tomorrow night, according to what I'm reading. I think that L.A. is a given. We've just we've played so well against them lately. I think we're going to get that. I think we have to get that. I think that we beat San Jose for no reason, and the Flames need to show themselves they can beat San Jose. I think we're going to struggle with Anaheim. Um, I don't necessarily think we'll lose, but I'm going to say that we get one point against them. Okay. I think we can... I think this is the real test, and I think the yeah, Flames... Yeah, that's the, the two games against Anaheim are the only two that I think are vitally important in the rest of the season. Because, I mean, like, even our, if the Flames don't play Anaheim in round one, they likely will in round two if they get that far. So they need to know what they can do against that team. So those are the two games that, like, if I was to only watch two of the last six, those would be the two. Of the last six, I think we were almost, have, and I hate to say it, but two of them are given. I think both LA games we win. Yeah, I think LA is just going to pack up the tent and, you know, skate home. <laughs> and I think the Anaheim games, and we have two games in a row against Anaheim, I think that we're, we'll talk about the Honda Center curse next week, but I think we're going to struggle even here just because I think Anaheim's a more dominant team than we are. Yeah, and they've been can... on a run themselves. They're 8-1-1 they in their last 10, and they're up 4 nothing on Vancouver right now as we're 
talking, so like it, uh, you know. I also think that even if we beat San Jose, it's not going to be an easy game, and I think that we might be a bit banged up going into the Anaheim series. Yeah. So I'm going to say that we pull off one point in Calgary against Anaheim. Okay. So grab your tickets, go to the Dome, and uh, Matt, unfortunately, we won't be at the Dome chilling with Jerome anymore. We're going to need a new playoff anthem this time around, but um, enjoy this last week of uh, Sea of Red. And let's get ready for 17th Avenue to come alive again, because that'll be the next time we're back home. After this will be uh, the playoffs. Yeah, either game one or game three. Exactly. So We'll see. We look forward to talking to everyone again after this homestand before the Calgary Flames play the same three teams again, but this time in California. So we'll talk to you guys after the homestand. Thanks for listening, everybody. Go Flames, go. Have an awesome week. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.